anytime anything bad happens in the world, whether it be in the open source space or anything else out there, if it gets enough attention, you're going to see the grifters crawling out of the floorboards to offer some solution that could have been put in place to make sure that thing never happened. And oftentimes, that solution completely misses the point. For example, in this case, you're seeing a lot of, hey, did you know that this would have never happened if you followed our best practices? Hey you, Mr. Overwork Maintainer, yeah, we know you don't have enough time to work on the project that was supposed to be a hobby in the first place, but how about you implement these strategies that you don't have enough time to use anyway, and you don't have enough time to work on the project, but somehow these strategies would have solved everything. Now I'm sure there are others that people are talking about, but I want to highlight two specific examples that I've seen making the rounds. Now before I do that, I just want to say, don't go and harass any of the individuals in this video. This is just a commentary video on things that you shouldn't do. I know that no matter what I say, people are still going to do so, but just be a normal person. The first one is this set of posts about a system called Salsa, and the second one is this blog post from the Open Source Security Foundation. Now to be fair to the OpenSSF, they got a lot of pushback for the way that this was written, and did end up going and updating the blog post, removing the really dumb part that shouldn't have been included because the rest of the blog post is totally fine. But as an example for future cases, I will be showing you the archive. Let's start with the first one. Note on all the XE drama. There are some technical solutions for such supply chain attack that can make an attack way harder, at least to hide the code in tarballs. Salsa dev is a solution. Combined with reproducible builds, it ensures that a software artifact is built exactly from the source given in a source repository, with the possibility to prove that and no way for any maintainer to tamper with in the highest level. Obviously, it's no magic bullet. It just raises the burden for an attacker. Obviously, the source code repo could be made to contain bad code, but you cannot anymore tamper at build time. The way this works is essentially quite easy. The whole build process is documented in the same repository. Builds are automated via CI and CD, and all that is to reach best support, done in an environment that prevents tampering, and crucially, is out of your control. Now, in an organization or a big open source project that actually has the ability to implement a solution like this, I have absolutely no doubt that it is going to have a positive effect, whether it be this solution or any other software-based solution that attempts to deal with malicious people being involved in your project. The issue, though, is what XZ as a project is, because XZ is not a well-maintained project that has resources to spare, that has maintainers to spare to set up a solution like this. XZ is a project that two years ago had one maintainer. It had a couple of passing commits from other people, but one person was working on it. Two years ago, they were convinced to hand off maintainership to a new person who seemed like they were a good maintainer. This person was the one who injected the back door. Two years ago, the maintainer was getting burnt out from XZ, which was basically just a hobby project, because there is a lot of things that depend on XZ. Just on Arch Linux alone, there is 150 direct dependencies, let alone all of the transitive dependencies, I have no idea how many things actually rely on XZ doing what XZ is supposed to do. That is a lot of pressure for a project that a lot of people just don't realize exists and that the developer is just working on it because they thought it was fun. This is a project that had basically no funding, basically no development, and as sad as it might sound to say, it makes sense why XZ was in this state because it's a compression library, most people just don't even realize it exists, unless you're an application developer who actually knows that you are using XZ in the project. It's not like GNOME, it's not like Flatpak, it's not like GIMP or Critter, which is something that the average user knows they're interacting with. It's one of these little libraries that sits in the background that lots of things rely on, but you don't even realize that you're relying on them. It's a project that you don't even know that you should care about.
If before the project was handed off to Giatan, last column put a system in place where the builds were being done automatically, neither of them had the ability to interact with them, that maybe could have stopped the attack we saw recently. But also, if that system was put in place, the attack would have been done in a different way, the code would have just been put directly into the repo, instead of being injected into the build process, so it actually wouldn't have stopped anything, it just would have changed the way it was done, and considering it took multiple months and one person seeing a 0.5 second delay for anybody to notice that something was up, I could imagine it still would have been ejected into the distros and still would have taken a bit of time to spot. But much more importantly, you cannot expect a single volunteer working on a hobby project that's already burnt out from working on the project to start implementing your complicated development procedure to make sure that this mythical software supply chain isn't somehow disrupted. They are not a supplier. You are just a raccoon digging through dumpsters for free code. Now, the open SSF post is very amusing because it's actually existed in multiple different forms. So this is the latest version. The specific part we want to talk about is threats in the open source software supply chain. This is the version where they remove the part that a lot of people complained about. Now, the original version of the blog post didn't have that part either, but for some reason, temporarily, this part existed. This is the part that everybody complained about. Now, earlier in the post, it explains what happened in the situation, how different distros are affected, what distros are doing to mitigate the situation, basically all great stuff that I think is explained pretty well, but let's have a look at the part in question. Now, this part here is in all three versions of the blog post. In the newest version, it is formatted in a much better way, but it is going to be present in every version. Basically, nothing bad is said here. It's pretty much just saying that because this is an open source project, things got spotted relatively quickly, and because the package was first shipped on the unstable experimental branches of each of these distros, Basically, it didn't cause that much damage and got caught pretty quickly. It didn't make its way out onto, like, an Ubuntu LTS, for example. The next part, though, this is the main part. A malicious or compromised maintainer is extremely difficult to guard against using automated tools or supply chain security technologies, which is kind of the opposite of what was being sold with Salsa. Funnily enough, um, Salsa is part of the open SSF, so... Yeah, um, I can see why they might have wanted to remove this part as well. Looking back at the last OpenSSF scorecard report on the XC repository, we do see a number of best practices such as code review, token permissions, branch protection, and static analysis were not enabled, nor did XZ have the OpenSSF best practices badge. It's difficult to predict whether these settings on their own would have prevented this backdoor. However, security best practices were not followed. I don't need a crystal ball to make this prediction. I can tell you right now, they wouldn't have stopped anything. For one very simple reason. Who would be the person implementing the best practices? Because it wouldn't be the overwork maintainer who was burnt out who didn't want to work on the project anymore. It would have been the person that implemented the back door. So they would have implemented the things in a way to make sure that what they were doing didn't get caught. As a simple example, who is doing code review when there is one person maintaining the project and that person is writing a back door? Well, it's the person writing the back door that's doing the code review. Who cares if the project's workflows follow the principle of least privilege? The only person working on the project is the person writing the back door. Who cares if the default and release branches are protected with GitHub's branch protection settings? Because the one person working on the project is writing the back door. Now, I love the scorecard because basically nothing, even really well-run projects, actually have a good security score. So XZ is 6.2, Golang is 6.4, Cargo is 7.3, Django is 7.2. So all of these projects have a score in the range of XZ. Maybe the score 
isn't actually relevant in this case. And as Jeff Triplett points out in his blog post, open SSF scorecard shows that Django Project is barely rated higher than XZ. Django is a good test of the quality of rating systems and scorecards. When Django ranks poorly or average, you are measuring the wrong things. This isn't a mistake that only the OpenSSF makes. I have seen a half dozen of the services ding them for things like not having a code of conduct and then linking two or three examples that attribute Django's code of conduct. Pointing out that someone who's already burnt out and never knew your best practices existed is a bad PR move. Even worse, we are now paying attention to your best practices which don't hold water. Even worse, if you aren't proactively offering funding to these solo projects you knew were destined to fail, you are actively part of the problem and trying to profit from it. Please stop making it worse for the next burnt out maintainer. Also, project maintainers hate being opted into things they have yet to ask or sign up for. At the end of the day, this was a maintainer who just didn't want to work on the project anymore, saw someone who seemed like they were doing a good job and gained the trust of the maintainer and they were given the project. That's happened so many times before and many times in the past there's been no problem whatsoever. But this one situation, it turns out that person was probably a fake name and was probably a state actor. We don't know what state. There are people saying, oh, it's probably from China because they have a Chinese sounding name. It's a fake name. We have no idea where the person is from. They're probably a state actor though. But what do you think? Do you think posts like this actually help to solve the problem? Or do you think they're just noise adding to the confusion? I would love to know. So if you like the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe, and Pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me. And don't forget to buy my course.